Hello. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? Good, and you? Good, thank you. Beautiful background. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, hi to everyone watching and thank you for tuning in for our webinar with Marisol from the Healthy Reefs Initiative um, based in Mexico at the moment, I believe. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Um, so Marisol is going to be talking about um, coral reefs and what we can do to help coral reefs. And I'm really excited as this is something a little bit different today, which will be really nice. Um, if you haven't watched one of these webinars before, I'll just tell you the technical information. This talk will last for about 20 to 30 minutes and then we'll have some questions from the audience. So as audience members, you're automatically muted and your video is switched off, um, but we'd love to hear from you. So please put any questions or comments in the Q&A box, which is on the Zoom toolbar on your screen um, at any time throughout the talk. And we will collate these and ask Marisol some of these questions at the end of the talk. We do have some really good webinars coming up over the next week. Um, we have one on Friday with Bex Carter. She's the Director of Operations for the Manta Trust. And she's gonna be talking about how you can get into manta conservation and help support manta research. Um, and then we have one on Monday with Dr. Guy Stevens, co-founder of the Manta Trust, and Sarah Richard, who is the founder of Girls That Scuba. Um, and they're gonna be having a chat about all things marine protected areas, World Oceans Day, um, and their best dive experiences, and how divers can link um, diving with conservation and research. Um, but for now, I'll pass you over to Marisol. Okay, thank you, Flossie, and thank you for the invitation to the Manta Trust and, and to Karen. Um, well, I will start sharing my screen. Let me know if you can see it. Perfect. Okay, good. Well, today I'm going to talk about how we do monitoring in the Mesoamerican Reef in the Healthy Reefs for Healthy People initiative. Uh, I have been working here almost 10 years now. Um, I am the communications consultant. So I will uh, drive you uh, through this journey on, on our Mesoamerican Reef. So first of all, I want you to see where we are. Uh, this is Mexico's map. And if you zoom in on this area, I am located in the Yucatan Peninsula. The Yucatan Peninsula is composed of three different states, Yucatan, Campeche, and Quintana Roo. And Quintana Roo is where I live, in Playa del Carmen, just in front of Cozumel Island that you might hear about. Uh, Quintana Roo shares uh, part of this Mesoamerican Reef with other three countries, which are Belize, uh, Guatemala, and Honduras. So we work uh, in these four different countries. It's 1,000 kilometers of reefs that we are surveying every two years. And what we do in the Healthy Reefs for Healthy People initiative is that we generate and analyze ecological data to evaluate the changes in the Mesoamerican Reef. We have more than 12 years of, of collecting data, so we have plenty of information to share. And also we promote and disseminate management indicators for managers and decision makers. And all our data is public in our webpage. Uh, we have a beautiful data portal that you can um, drive through it, uh, take data out of it, generate graphs. Uh, we have pictures of the sites. You can see how it looks, if it's good, if it's bad. And we also serve as a means of interaction and storage of information that is useful for the managers, for the NGOs, for the private sector, and for the scientists too. So I want to start uh, really quick. What is a coral reef? You may already know. This is a beautiful picture of uh, an Acropora palmata. Um, it's uh, the Yelkhorn coral, which is actually the one that you see in my background right now. And the corals are all composed of many of tiny, tiny animals that are called polyps. And inside of these polyps, we have a microalgae, so Santilli, uh, which is working with symbiosis with the, with the corals, with the polyps. Um, this microalgae brings nutrients uh, to the corals. And you see all these tentacles. Uh, also, they serve to catch nutrients from the water. 
So the addition of all these polyps is what composes the coral. So if you zoom in, you can see like flowers. Um, some polyps are, have this shape. They vary a lot depending on the species. But this is actually what you see when you, go, you get very close without touching the, the corals. And the corals uh, grow between 0.3 centimeters to 10 centimeters per year. It also depends on the species. And the species that I am showing you here, the Elhorn coral, uh, that one is a, one of the species that grows faster. So why are reefs important? Well, they have uh, around 25, 33% of the biodiversity in the ocean. Um, so all the marine life uh, is gathered in this place. Uh, it also brings a source of employment because of tourism, especially here in Quintana Roo. Uh, a lot of people rely on tourism activities. It's a source of food. Uh, many of the commercial species that we are eating comes from the reef, groupers, snappers, lobsters. Also, it's a source of medicine. There are uh, some research going on there uh, to generate some of the medicines that we are using. And also, it serves as a barrier to the storms and the hurricanes. Uh, corals like this one, like the Elhorn coral, can diminish the force of the storms and hurricanes that are going to hit the coastal line uh, in a very high quantity. So we depend on having healthy reefs like this one uh, to diminish the force of the hurricanes when they reach our uh, land. Also, uh, it has a lot of recreative value and cultural value. Uh, this picture here is of a bull shark uh, here in Playa del Carmen, we have the Berkshire season from November to March. And a lot of people also come here to dive with these uh, fabulous animals. And also the reefs are fish spawning aggregation sites for uh, many commercial species like groupers. Um, so that's mainly the importance of, of the reefs. So in the Mesoamerican Reef, we have more than 500 fish species and more than 65 coral species. And more than 2 million of people are depending on this resource for their livelihoods. Here in Quintana Roo, we have an estimated value in 172 billions of dollars per year. And the tourism employs 35% of the population in Quintana Roo. Um, also, Quintana Roo generates a GDP of more than 12,000 uh, millions of dollars, which represents 88% uh, coming from the tourism sector. So as you can see, tourism is the main activity, and it's directly linked to the health of the, of the reef. So the Healthy Reefs Initiative started uh, 12 years ago with this question, is the Mesoamerican Reef healthy? We wanted to know how it was back then. And also, if we are doing all that we can to help the reef, and what can we do extra to improve the health of the reef? So what we do is that we generate these report cards on the health of the Mesoamerican Reef every two years. So the first one was launched in 2008. So every two years we have been publishing uh, these report cards. All of them are free and available in our web page that I will share at the end. And I will talk a little bit about the last one that we launched in February, 2020. Um, and I will talk to you more about the results we had. Um, so how we do generate uh, these report cards. The most important part is that we have to go to the field and this is the fun part of the work and uh, right now we should be doing this um, but because of COVID we can't go to the ocean but what we do is that we use this methodology that it's called AGRA, Atlantic and Gulf Rapid Reef Assessment. It's not very rapid <laughs> or not as rapid as we will want to uh, most of the times we require a team of around six people, as you can see in this picture. Um, that would be the ideal. So three people will be doing fishes and three people will be doing the benthic and coral portion of the survey. 
So I will start with the benthic and coral people. Uh, they use these lines uh, we have that have weight. So they lay on top of the corals. It's, they use six transects of 10 meters each. And they collect data about diseases in the corals, recruits if we have new corals growing in that area, uh, if the coral is alive or if it has macroalgae on top of it. And, and they also register some invertebrates. And the fish people, they are the ones that swim the most. Uh, we do 10 transects, 30 meters each. And we, we use these PVC uh, T bars that you can see in the picture uh, to take data on the fishes, the species, the abundance of those uh, species and the size. And also we take the rugosity, which is the picture you see in the bottom. And the rugosity is to see how elevated or not, or if it's a reef that it's flat. Uh, in that way, we can see how, if there is some relation of having more uh, rugosity or not for the fish abundance. So with those two um, surveys, we can generate a reef health indicator. Uh, and we have four different indicators that we take into account. The corals, as you can see, it's in green. We expect to have a coral cover that is high in order to have a healthy reef. Um, the macroalgae, which are competing with the corals, so we expect that one to be in low quantities to have a healthy reef. And also the biomass of herbivorous fish and commercial fish. Um, for herbivorous fish, we are taking into account the parrot fishes and the surgeon fishes that are the blue ones that you see there. And for the commercial fish groupers and snappers. So grouper is this one uh, in the bigger picture. So the combination of these four indicators uh, can give us a reef health index that will be classified in different colors, which are different categories. Uh, so at the end, we will know the condition of each reef, if it's critical, poor, fair, good, or very good. So the idea, I will not go deeply into the numbers that you see here, but the idea is to have a map like this one, like the 2020, that easily you can picture uh, how the reefs are going based on these colors. So if you see this very quickly without seeing the numbers, you can see that most of the reefs in the Mesoamerican reef are between a critical, a poor, or a fair condition. Um, so in this last report card, we almost monitored 300 sites, and all the, all the countries had very similar results regarding on having a lot of critical, fair, and, and poor um, reefs. A um, few of them, like Belize and Mexico, had reefs in very good condition. In the case of Mexico, it's located here in the Cozumel Island, and that's because we have a lot of uh, herbivorous fish and a big size of these fishes, especially parrot fishes. So more or less, these are the colors that represent the map for Mexico, for Quintana Roo. Uh, it goes through Cancun all the way down to Banco Chinchorro and Escalac. And the pictures that you see in the right is just for you to have an idea of how it looks. When we have a reef in a green or, or dark green condition, which is good or very good, it looks like the upper picture uh, with corals very vibrant, with a lot of coral, they are alive, and a lot of fishes, a lot of biomass of different species of fishes. And when we have reefs that are in red, yellow, or orange color, we see more likely the picture in the bottom, which is brown, gray colors, full of macroalgae that are competing uh, with the corals. So what we do to protect these reefs in the, in the Healthy Reefs Initiative, we also give a set of recommendations of, for all the sectors of actions that they need to take in order to preserve this fabulous Mesoamerican reef or Mesoamazing reef, as we like to say. Uh, so in the Healthy Reefs this year, we launched uh, different projects. Um, 
First of all, the parrot fish protection. I don't know if you know this, but the parrot fishes, they generate sand when they poo. They are eating the macroalgae and with these beaks that you see that they are very big, with these beaks, they take part of the coral and the coral has carbonate calcium, it's composed of carbonate calcium. So when they digest this, they put sand. So they are sand machines that we really need also uh, in the reef to have these beautiful beaches. Um, we have been working on the parrot fish protection for many years. Um, here in Mexico for six years. Uh, finally, last year we were able to protect 10 different species of parrot fishes. And the other countries, Belize, Guatemala, and Honduras, also have protection for these parrot fishes. So we can say that the Mesoamerican Reef region finally has protection um, for this important herbivorous fish. Um, we also have programs to accelerate the reduction of macroalgae manually taking uh, the macroalgae out because they are growing on top of the coral. The growth of the macroalgae is mainly due because we have inadequate wastewater treatment or sometimes not, no treatment at all. And when we are not treating the water correctly, the one that we flush in our houses, it goes directly to our underground rivers. In this portion of the country, we have a karstic system. That means that we have limestone beneath our feet. So it's like a Gruyere cheese, and all the water filters down there. And then we have the underground rivers and the cenotes, the sinkholes. Um, so our underground rivers connect directly to the ocean. So there is a flux of water from the underground rivers to the ocean and vice versa. So everything that we use in our houses goes to our sewage and if it's not treated correctly, goes into the underground rivers and eventually to the ocean and that's bringing a lot of nutrients that make the macroalgae to grow and grow faster. We also have um, a program uh, basically in Honduras to grow diadema sea urchin. We have seen that the places that have more density of this sea urchin have less macroalgae. They are very effective on, on eating the macroalgae. And also we have programs of king crab mariculture. These are pilot programs, and mainly in Mexico and in Belize. The king crabs are very efficient because they are very, very uh, um, detailed to only eat the macroalgae, not coral or anything else. Uh, so these are the four uh, programs that we have right now. And I am also going to talk about what can we do in our houses. Um, because, well, this is things that scientists are doing in the water and other NGOs, sometimes with the, with the help of the government, etc. But what can we do as citizens from our houses? Um, so first of all, connect to the sewage. Check your houses if you are connected to the sewage how it works, because many, many times, especially in touristic places like where I live, you arrive to the place, you don't know anything about it, and you don't check this. Um, but probably your house is not connected to the sewage and everything is going down there to the underground rivers without any type of treatment. Then you already know this, reduce, reuse and recycle. No straws, no plastic and water, uh, no plastic water bottles and bags, no stereo foam. Um, it is more frequent to see pictures like this one, like a fish with rubber band um, around its body, around its head, cutting it off. Um, so we already know this, that plastics are causing a lot of damage worldwide. So we really need not only to reduce, but to eliminate the use of single-use plastics from, from our lives. Um, here, it's very common to see a lot of plastics in the beach. There are a lot of programs also for beach cleanups, uh, but we have to stop using this type of, of materials. We only use them for five to 20 minutes, and then they go to the trash. And if we are lucky, it ends up in a landfill, but many, many times it also ends up in an ecosystem, in the jungle, in the beach, in the ocean. Also try to buy to the fishing cooperatives. The fishing cooperatives are operating legally. 
So we know that what they are fishing, it's, it's sustainable and it's correct to eat in different seasons. And we also generate a local income to the fishing cooperatives. Change to leads, and you will ask me why this has to be with the reefs. <laughs> Um, if we save energy, we're also contributing to diminish climate, um, climate change. So by reducing the, our consumption of energy in our homes, um, just by changing the LEDs, you can reduce it 90%. So it's a lot. So in this way, we contribute to diminish the high temperatures in the ocean. Don't eat parrot fish, shark, queen conch. <laughs> Um, here in Quintana Roo, we have now the law that protects the parrot fishes. Also, we have laws that protect the sharks. Um, also, we have a special ban for Queen Kong for some months. And um, also, Queen Kong is only allowed to be fished in certain areas. So, if we don't know where it comes from, it's better not to eat it because illegal fishing also happens a lot everywhere in the world. Respect the bands. We have bands for everything that we are eating, um, starting with the sharks here in Quintana Roo, in the Yucatan Peninsula, it's very common to eat cazón, which is a, a species of, of shark or a very small shark. Um, we have bands for the queen conch, for the groupers, for the octopus, for the shrimp, pretty much for everything that we are eating. Sometimes these bands are at the same time of the breeding season or the reproductive season. Uh, so they protect um, species, but, but sometimes they don't go exactly with the reproductive season as is the case uh, of the sharks. Uh, in this picture, actually this shark from Playa del Carmen is pregnant, as you can see, it's not that she is chubby, she is pregnant. Also try to use biodegradable products for your personal hygiene and for cleaning your houses. Because as I told you, everything that we use goes directly into the sewage and we don't know exactly what kind of treatment we are having in each of the places that, that you all are living. Uh, so let's try to shift to these biodegradable products. In the past, they were very expensive and difficult to afford. But right now there is so many options that the prices have gone down, so it's more easy to acquire these products. Also, when you go into the ocean, no touching, no feeding, and no extraction. This picture is something very popular that we see in areas like Akumal, where the sea turtles are gathering every year. And uh, right now there is a lot of enforcement, uh, people patrolling the, the ocean, the bay, it's actually a bay, uh, to uh, make sure that people are not touching the turtles. No feeding, um, some tour operators are also feeding sea turtles, for example. Um, no extraction. Uh, in some of the islands here in Quintana Roo, like Isla Mujeres, sometimes we see people selling starfish, corals, uh, Queen Kong, um, so they are extracting these uh, illegally and selling. So please, when you travel to other places, make sure you are not contributing to this industry that find at the end is illegal. Also try to use more renewable energy. Um, in some countries, like in Mexico, it's still expensive to change to solar panels, for example. But if it's uh, possible for you, try to use renewable energy in your home or in your work. And also at, at the end, but not the least important, uh, to participate in beach cleanups or coral restoration programs. Um, beach cleanups are organized all the way in Quintana Roo. I know it is attacking um, the, the symptoms of the pollution, but it's something that has to be done. Uh, it also has to have a lot of educational programs in order to prevent that people keep polluting uh, our places. And coral restoration programs, we also have different ones here in Quintana Roo, one with uh, Dr. Anastasia Vanasak in a university here in Puerto Morelos. 
and with Claudia Padilla in a Fisheries Institute also in Puerto Morelos, just to mention two because they are uh, different ones. And they are also partners of the Healthy Reefs Initiative. So I think this will be it. Uh, we know what we have to do and let's do it. Uh, the information is there. Uh, so we have to communicate this to our friends, to our family, keep pushing to have the changes that we need. And I also want to thank to more than 73 institutions that are collaborating with us in the Healthy Risk Initiative from different sectors, government, private sector, NGOs, uh, fishermen and academia. So thank you for coming to this webinar. Uh, here is my email, uh, our web page. Remember that you can download the report cards and play with our data portal. And also you can find me and Healthy Reefs in Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. So thank you and let me know if you have some questions. Thank you so much. That was really interesting and, and good to highlight all the different ways that we as individuals can help. Um, I think it's easy to feel disempowered to do anything, but there's so many things that we can do to help, isn't there? Yes, it's tiny changes, but tiny changes add up. Yeah. And, and if, really very big. <laughs> yeah, and you can have an influence on all your friends and family and so many people that you wouldn't imagine you'd have an influence on. So. It's just creating new habits for our daily lives. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, we've been asking people what their favorite moments with manta rays are, but for you, I'll ask you, what's the favorite thing you've experienced whilst you've been monitoring? Have you had any surprises from marine life? Well, this picture here, uh, it's from a reef that it's called Limones. Mm -hmm. and it is located in a natural protected area in Puerto Morelos. It's a national park. Okay. Um, this is a success story from many years ago. This area used to be an area to do snorkeling and to do fishing. Mm -hmm. And with the data that we generated and the CONAMP, uh, which is the governmental organization in charge of protecting the natural protected areas, uh, this, this site was um, closed and no activities regarding tourism or fishing are allowed anymore. Mm -hmm. So you can only go there if you have a special permit to do monitoring, for example, <laughs> to do uh, surveys or research. So this place is absolutely fabulous because everywhere you look, you only see elkhorn coral and they are healthy. Um, there is a nurse shark that it's all the time is there. You always see it. Have you named um, it? No. <laughs> we only know that he is there. I have some videos. Uh, we went to do a documentary in this place a while ago. Uh, the documentary is, is called Flows. You can see the documentary in Vimeo if you look for it. Uh, it's in English with uh, Spanish subtitles. Um, so yeah, um, this place is amazing. Every time we have to go and do monitoring there, we are very happy because it's one of the crowns of, of uh, yeah. How long do you get to stay there for monitoring? We only stay there for like one hour. Oh, um, oh no. Yeah, it's pretty far uh, from, it's like in the edge, uh, the end of the, of the park. So it's, it's far, and it's a very shallow place actually. You have like four meters of water, more or less. It's very, very shallow, but it's amazing. And yeah, I had been in different adventures, also in Honduras with my colleagues, uh, going to do monitoring the Swan Islands, which are very far away also. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw sharks there. Uh, so yeah, different different, very different experiences here in the Mesoamerican Reef and also in other reefs. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, someone's asked about coral bleaching. Do you have a lot of bleached coral there? Yeah, well, we started uh, doing this coral bleaching monitoring also in 2015. Uh, bleaching starts more or less uh, August, September, October when the water starts getting a little bit warmer. Um, after the summer. So yeah, bleaching has been increasing during the years. 
you can see in our report cards uh, how it has been increasing. But bleaching doesn't mean that the coral is dead. Uh, what happens is that these microalgae that I told you, so Sanfeli, when the temperature raises, they don't like it. So they take their baths and they go out of the coral. So this sosanteli is giving the color to the coral. So that's why we see it white, because it's carbonate calcium. So we are just seeing the skeleton. But if the water goes down on the, on the temperature, uh, this sosanteli comes back and the coral keeps living. If that doesn't happen, then the coral can be full of macroalgae and then it's dead. Uh, but after bleaching, we still have hope uh, to recover. And that's what has been happening. Uh, but yeah, worldwide, the uh, bleaching events have been uh, going in increase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the Maldives, that's probably the biggest threat to the coral, or definitely the biggest threat to the coral right now. Um, so it's interesting yeah. to hear. Good to hear that they're not as affected by bleaching, maybe, as the reefs in the Maldives. Yeah, it, it happens so differently. Like in Australia, they lost a lot of their corals yeah. because of massive bleaching events. It yeah. was not like that here in Mexico or in Honduras or Belize or Guatemala. Um, I also had the opportunity uh, to go to Palau with another NGO that I work for, Psychology. We went there in February this year and, and there were no signs of bleaching or anything. Like it's absolutely protected and you can see it. You don't have to do monitoring. Just seeing it with sharks everywhere, manta rays uh -oh. everywhere fishes, the most amazing corals alive, and humongous. They, they were so big, these wow. colonies. Okay, I'm know. adding it to my bucket list. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, Palau is a, is a great place. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. We will move on. We have a question from Louis. Louis has asked, if it's a good solution to regulate and mo modify populations by ourselves, such as algae, king crabs, are there any issues with doing this? Well, uh, first of all, you have to get permits. And also, you have to do research in the areas um, to, to move species around. We are not moving them around to a different environment. We are just in the same places, but just putting more so they keep doing their job. And we know that in the past, there was more than more than the ones that we have right now. There were more king crabs, more sea urchins. So we are not manipulating in that way. We are just helping uh, to repopulate the reefs that used to have these species. So we have actually, humans have caused these species to go and now we need to help them. Yeah, so we can. <laughs> yeah because like the pace of the threats is faster than the pace of conservation, to be honest. So we have to go uh, quickly. We need right. an army of conservationists. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So okay. the reefs need some help. Yeah. Okay. And also like with the corals, uh, with coral restoration, also you have to check the place that you are doing coral restoration because if you choose a place that has a lot of polluted water, a lot of nutrients, it will not work because these small recruits of corals will be full of macroalgae in a matter of days. Mm -hmm. So you also have to choose the areas very carefully. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there is a lot of studies that had to be done before um, to start putting the hands in the ocean. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, we have a good question from Steffi. Hi, Steffi. She's asking, what kind of penalties exist for tourists or agencies who are not respecting the ocean? For example, selling corals or tourists touching turtles. And do you think that it's effective to use these penalties? If not, what else can, can we use? Yes, uh, well, there are penalties, for example, fishing. Uh, there are um, places that fishing is allowed and there are some other places that fishing is not allowed. So if you get caught doing illegal fishing like with ARP and also the gear that you are using like arpons, hawaiianas, things like that that are forbidden, you can go to the jail or to pay a fee um, because of this. Um, regarding on touching or kicking the coral etc, 
uh, it's more regulated between the touristic companies that have uh, in order or all their legal permits to operate. Like if someone sees that a tour is doing this, they just call on the radio, they tell, they go to CONAMP um, and they say that they saw this uh, tour operator doing that. So they can do something about it. But it's more like self also regulated between the people that are doing the correct things. Um, there's manuals of best practices. Um, for example, for the bull shark, there is a manual that was done voluntarily. And also, if you go to coral.org, it's an NGO with whom we are working to. They have a list of, of best practices. So that's the best, just to survey between ourselves and to tell the authorities if you are seeing something wrong. Okay, thanks, very helpful. Um, Ricardo has asked if you could just repeat the documentary name and how he can find it, the one that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, it's Flows, F-L-O-W-S, and it's, it's in Vimeo. Um, that documentary mainly talks about the um, underground rivers and its connection to the jungle, to the mangroves and to the reef. So there is a lot of uh, local people that we had been working here for a long time, uh, giving, uh, well, science results and also their opinion on how the things are, are going here. So it's very interesting because we have very different ecosystems in this Yucatan Peninsula, starting with the underground rivers. Wow. All our water comes from there. We don't have mountains, uh, we don't have superficial rivers. All our water comes from, from the cenotes. Wow, amazing. I yeah. actually, I did some dives in cenotes in um, near Tulum and they were incredible. Like yeah. the, it's the light coming through, the, the caves, everything. Yeah, we have so many different cenotes. You could go to a different one each day of the year. <laughs> so oh, the cave divers. <laughs> okay, we have one from Alejandra. I hope I said that right. Um, he says, or she says, that they're from Guatemala, studying about climate change, and they would like something to research. Um, but he, they are wondering if you have any information on the metal absorption of corals, or if corals can regulate that. I don't have in my mind right now um, an article about that, but if she can email me, uh, I think you are still seeing my screen. Yeah. Uh, if you can email me, I can help you out to check out. Um, also, if you go to these places where um, scientific articles are published, there are some that are open access, so you can give a quick look over there. But yeah, email me and, and I can take a look around and ask to my colleagues also. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I think we'll just have a couple more. So we have one from Rosie. Hi, Rosie. Rosie says, which is the most important reef in the world for the ocean, in your opinion? Oh, wow. That's a big one. <laughs> All reefs are important. All <laughs> reefs are important. Uh, the biggest one is the Australia one, the biggest one in the world. And the Mesoamerican reef is the second largest reef in the world. Um, <laughs> but we get like 80% of the oxygen from the ocean. So all oceans and all reefs are important. I wouldn't pick one. Uh, all of them have connections. For example, in the Mesoamerican Reef, we know that the parrot fishes travel from Honduras to Mexico. Uh, so we are connected. So everything that we do in one place has an effect in the other one. Even if you don't live here, uh, what you do back at home may have an effect here. You know, we, are, we are so, so connected with all our actions. So I wouldn't pick one that would be more important. Maybe there are some reefs that are more amazing, but not more important. <laughs> all of them are important. Okay, great answer. Thank you very much. And finally, we've been asking everybody about their favorite book or documentary about the natural world um, on these webinars, and they are going on to our Mantra Trust book club, which can be found on the website. Um, what would your recommendation be? Well, I had seen many. Well, go and see flows because we. That's a good one, actually. 
Uh, but also another one that I just recently saw is called Sonic Sea. And it talks about the, the whales, how they use their sonar um, to locate everything, food, mates, um, piers, um, the beach, etc., and how all the things that we are doing with oil exploration, with boat traffic in the ocean, is affecting the whales and their behavior and their uh, survival, actually. So I really like this documentary. Um, it's available. If you go to the IFO web page, uh, let me type it here. Um, it's not letting me type. Oh. But if you go to IFO, I-F-A-W, this is an organization that works to protect wildlife mm -hmm. around the world. If you go there, you can re register and you can watch this documentary for free till the 8th of June, which okay. is the Ocean's Day. <laughs> so uh, be sure to watch it this weekend. Um, the screening is, is amazing. The, the images of the whales are fabulous. I used to work with blue whales uh, back when I was living in Baja California Sur. I worked there for five years and I did my master with blue whales. So wow. this is really good. And also it opens our eyes of how much we influence in the ocean. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I will, I will recommend that one just because I just saw it. Okay, so I for I-F-A-W, Sonic Sound. Sonic C. Sonic C, okay. Uh, I, IFO is the NGO, so if you go to their uh, web page, uh, you can find a place where to register to download this. Well, not to download, to, to watch the Sonic Sea. Great, thank you so much. I think I'm going to head over there and check that out this weekend. Yes. Um, okay, thank you very much, Marisol, for answering the questions so well and for such an interesting talk on a slightly different topic to Mantas, which is always nice. Um, I hope you enjoyed yourself. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Um, well, visit our social media and if you have more questions, you can write us there or to my email. Thank okay. you very much for the interest. Perfect. Okay, thanks again, everyone, for watching and for some great questions. Um, thanks to Marisol. As always, you can find out more about our upcoming webinars and uh, about manta rays and devil rays on our website and our social media pages at Manta Trust. Um, and you can find the latest webinars on mantatrust.org slash webinars. Um, we have one coming up with Bex Carter on manta conservation and how you can volunteer and get involved. And then one next Monday with Guy Stevens and Sarah Richard of Girls That Scuba. Um, so that's going to be a fun one, especially for World Oceans Day. Um, as always, you can support us and we would love your support. So you can join the Cyclone. It's a members only hub where we share our latest research and research trips and findings. Um, and all funds raised will go towards manta research and conservation. Um, but that's it from me for now. And thanks again to Marisol and hopefully see some of you on Friday for Vex's webinar. Bye Marisol. Bye. Thank you everyone.